recreational activities, but mostly depicting the ice cutting business. It was a huge business. It started in the pond in the 1850s. Uh, the firm of Daniel Draper and Son uh, started there, constructed some ice houses. The following year, they had a railroad line, a spur of the railroad come off the line and curve over to the pond, to the south shore of the pond, so that they could transport the ice quickly into Boston, put it on ships, and send it to the, literally to the far corners of the, of the world. And massive ice houses were built on the south end of the pond. These were what they looked like. They would store them there. They would actually map out the area, clear the area for the snow, map it out into big blocks, use horses to pull large shows. Men with saws, cut the ice and then float it up a channel, put it up a conveyor belt and store it. Um, and they'd get a whole year's worth of ice for commercial purposes. Um, again, to, to be sent worldwide or to be sent to the local area. And this is uh, Louis Linskett's depiction of, of what it looked like. And when he was a child, as I said, he was born in the 1870s, the ice business was very much going. It continued from the 1850s on up to the 1930s at, at Hong Kong. Um, the harvest in 1854 was 50,000 tons of ice. I did it. Many of you probably were there. Remember the program I did of winters in Wuhan about a year and a half ago, a year, a year ago, January, I think. And we showed some of these uh, same slides and talked about, you know, not to be politically correct or incorrect, but there's got to be something to global warming because if you had a, if you had 50,000 tons of ice, the pond very rarely now freezes over at all, let alone uh, deep enough to cut ice on a commercial basis. You can't imagine the winters. The winters had to be much, much more severe. This is a map of uh, the south end of the pond, southeast portion of the pond from 1875. It shows the location of the ice house. That's the corner of present day Arlington Road and Lake Avenue, which at that point was called Pond Street. You can see the railroad line that comes in from the Winchester Town Line and curves its way over to the pumping station, which we'll talk about a little later. And those are all, all ice houses. This again is the southeast corner of the pond in 1875. Uh, ice houses were built on the north end of the pond, on, on the Sturgis Street end of things in 1874. And this is a map from 1889 showing a couple of the ice houses, three ice houses on the, on the north end of, of an area that they still call today the Ice House Lot down on Sturgis Street. Sturgis Street, you'll notice, wasn't connected to Water Street. If you drive in Water Street from the parkway and you take a sharp right, you're actually still on Water Street even today. And that's why. You, think you, you might think you're on Sturgis Street, but you're not. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting map for a, several reasons. Uh, you'll see along the shoreline of the pond at uh, the top, E.W. Hudson. It's Edward W. Hudson who purchased the Hon Pond House. He lived there for many years. He purchased it essentially from uh, William Sturgis, I think in the 1850s. And he lived there until his death, and his wife lived there until her death uh, in the 1920s. And that's the Hon Pond House that we just saw a little while ago. They owned a lot of land, including all the shoreline of Hon Pond across the street from their house. Uh, you'll see Canal Street there, which is the present day Allington Road. Beacon Street was still there. An interesting map, and you'll see the Dow Tannery on the lower left-hand corner there, which is the um, straddled Town Meadow Brook. The brook still runs through there today. It's a massive tannery. We'll see a few pictures of later. This is a picture from 1895. Now you'll see how Lewis Lutzkitz did a pretty good job in his sketch, didn't he? This is a, an actual photo of the ice houses and men channeling the ice into the conveyor belt. Another picture from 1895. These were pretty large buildings. They held a lot of ice. And it was quite a business. Um, you know, in, in 1861, you could work, uh, you'd work from dawn to dusk, because it was a seasonal business, obviously, but, and you earned a dollar a day from dawn to dusk working on the ice, ice business. I'll see if my notes caught up to me. 
This is the structure of the south end of the pond. You remember that 1875 map? This is the structure we saw wrapping itself around the southeast corner of the pond near the intersection of Arlington Road and Lake Avenue. And then on the right side is the kind of the end of, the, of another similarly sized structure. And you can see the bush that held the conveyor belt on that middle structure there. It goes right out into the water. And you can see the railroad tracks that led, led over to the pumping station area. And this picture is dated 1910. A company called the Boston Ice Company owned all that land on the south shore of the pond. Uh, they stopped operating on the South Shore a few years later, probably by about 1914 or so, 1915. But the North End, the ice houses, they kept cutting ice on the pond and operating there uh, into the 1930s. And then there were some ice companies that, or 1940s, and then there were some ice companies that operated after that as well on the North End of the pond, we'll talk about a little later. Just another assessor's map from 1906 that just shows you the ice structures, it shows you the railroad coming down to the, to the uh, pumping station. They were pretty good, and it just gives you an idea of where you are here at the corner of Arlington Road and Lake Avenue. Also across the street from, the, from Lake Avenue where the railroad tracks cross the street, you'll see the brook, Pond Pond Brook, which still is the outlet of the pond at the south end. It's now the Scally Dam, the William Scally Dam. That one pond brook is still in its present location. And right next to the brook and the railroad tracks was a company owned by the, a building, excuse me, owned by the Edison Company. It was built as a, a power plant, uh, but a woman electric and illuminating light and heat company. Around 1890, or in the 1890s, and they say this is 1906, there was a pretty big structure there, and the structure stayed there until the 1950s. So many of you should remember that big red structure that was owned for many, many years by the Boston Edison Company. Used again in its very early days to generate electricity and then subsequently used uh, for storage and, and maintenance functions by the Edison. It really uh, took a hit in the hurricanes of 1954 and Edison started looking for a new facility. They had long ago built their substation on Cove Street over the Winchester line. Um, Lake Gavin. But they had kept this to the 1950s until they bought a piece of land up on Locust Street and then they moved their uh, maintenance operations up there. That's what the structure looked like in its earliest days with a large chimney. Again, right opposite the Scally Dam where the University Apartments are located today. And those apartments were built in the early 1960s once this building uh, was torn down. The inside of that building is a Beautiful old, big old room there, as they call the dynamo room. A lot of old equipment, a lot of brass, fixtures, kind of a neat old place. If you work for Edison, maybe you remember some of this. This is a, a slide that I used uh, a year and a half ago in the program. Uh, ice cutting begins today, this is 1912, 13 inch cakes. So again, the ice was frozen enough to support a thriving commercial ice business uh, from the 1850s on, on up into the 20th century, 13 inch thick ice. And it, the article itself is difficult to read, I realize, from, that, from this uh, angle, but the um, several firms I mentioned, and thousands of pounds of ice were, were uh, harvested. And I also used this slide, I, I, always, I thought this was sad, but it also is uh, instructive on a couple of things. Hoss drowned at Hong Kong, this is from 1913, and I'm going to read it again. Hong Kong Ice Company val lost valuable animal in 40 feet of water. A hoss weighing 1,300 pounds, valued at $200, the property of the Hong Kong Ice Company, broke through the ice at the pond this morning and was drowned. The horse had been driven out of the ice when the men started their day's work at 3.30 a.m. That was instructive to me. The men worked. You know, it was a seasonal job and you had to get it done. Uh, so they started well before the sun came up. Uh, but his weight proved too much for the ice to sustain. And in anticipation of such mishaps, horses was employed in this work, a safeguarded by a rope about the neck, but it was of no 
uh, avail in this instance in the Haas uh, sink. And I made the comment a year and a half, and I'll repeat it, that uh, you know, the Haas was valuable. They had ropes around them. The men, they could fall in, they didn't care. You know? uh, and, a, and a few, I'm sure, did over the, over the course of 50, 60, 70 years of ice cutting. So it was quite a business. Uh, this is the north end, it's a 1924 map, and you'll see the large, those little large structures of the kind we saw in the pictures, owned by the Hong Kong Ice Company. There's a series of smaller structures uh, right behind them, uh, low structures, if you really blew it up, it would say wagon shed storage and that type of thing. This is the Hong Kong Ice Company, 1924, still cutting ice, still storing in those large structures. You'll see now that Sturgis Street has been constructed all the way through, and you'll see the tannery is gone, and Wuben Parkway has been built in its place. So certain changes took place there. But ice cutting is still going on. Some of you may remember a cutting like this. You put it in your window, uh, and yet the man came around once a week or whatever, and he delivered ice to you. And you'll see the cut. That's the front and the back of the car. How many remember a cut like this? Oh, I do. I won't say it. <laughs> I'm not old enough to remember that. <coughs> but you are. Um, and you turn the cut, right? If you, you see the 100 pounds on the side, on the top, and 75 pounds, and 50 pounds, and 25 pounds. So depending on the size of the ice block that you wanted, you put in your front window, your door window, and you turn the cut, and the ice man would know what size ice to put the tongs around it schlep over his shoulder and go up your steps uh, to the second floor of your house and whatever, and bring you And the back of the cot is almost as interesting. Hong Kong Ice Company down the bottom, Beacon Street. Um, you know, the Hong Kong Ice Company operated there until, I think, into the 40s, even after they stopped cutting ice on the pond, they still operated their ice business there, and then they also had a Winchester address. And that ice house lot, if you dig around up there, as, as a friend of mine has, has done, uh, really amused, he, he every now and then just wanders out there and digs around. And he found in one of his journeys uh, a sign, started, stumbled on something, he dug a little further, and he unearthed Hong Kong Ice Company sign that's on the front of the uh, doorway as you enter. If you didn't see it on the way in, you can take a peek on the way out. But anyway, Hong Kong Ice Company. We'll switch gears a little, talk about the a business that's still sort of, of sorts, it's still there. The Wuben Waterworks opened in 1872. This picture was actually taken in 1885. It's taken from Arlington Road, which was a dirt road at that time, across the shores of the pond. And on the far left, you can see one of the big ice houses, as well as another house that was up on Cove Street. Um, the pumping station has, there's a chimney there that stretched up into the heavens, and it's been there, a uh, very picturesque spot, even today. Uh, there's a, an old postcard view of it from the early part of the 1900s, the way it looked. And many of us remember that beautiful uh, look, and, and there was a huge rock formation in the middle of the uh, well-manicured lawn, and that's what the old pumping station looked like. And of course, that old portion without the chimney is still there today. It actually started, it was built in 1872. The water was first pumped through the system in 1873. This is a sign that's on the wall down there with the old pumping station when they started the system. They actually started it, uh, when they dug the foundation, they, they had a, everybody had a well until that point, but the women's population with all the immigration in the 1850s and 60s, especially the Irish immigrants, um, population exploded, so they needed a municipal water system. And they realized that by the late 1860s, they had the committee, they went around different parts of the country, they studied other water systems, and they originally were gonna pump water directly from Hong Kong, but they needed the pumping station, so they started construction, and when they started digging the foundation, Station. Water started pouring in, seeping in, not from the pond, but from like the land side of things. Uh, and they put a pump in and they 
tried to pump it up, and the water kept coming in. So they put a second pump in, and that didn't keep up with the water. And they put a third pump in, and that didn't keep up with the water. And finally, it dawned on one of them, said, hey, this water isn't coming from one pond, it's coming from the ground. They had essentially tapped into a, a low-level, shallow well field, and they had their first well. So they decided not to try to pump it out, but to use it. So they tested it and everything, and it looked good. So they, their first, uh, yeah, they call it a galley well field, right next to the pumping station. They switched their plans. They put in the pumps just in case they had to pump water from the pond. But they basically converted everything to use the water that was coming in the well. And that was the first uh, system. And they actually never had to pump water directly from the pond from 1873 until 1907. So 30, 40 years they got away with using the well field when they had some severe droughts in 1907. This is a picture, it's no longer there, but this is a picture of the old 1872 steam pump. In 1907, as I mentioned, they had severe drought and they had to pump water directly from the pond. They went and looked at the well. The well field was finally too shallow. They weren't getting enough water from it. The city's population had increased and they needed more water on an average daily basis. So they put in a new uh, pump. They put in a new pump at the station. Uh, it was manufactured in Ohio. That's still there today. It's not used today, but it's still there today in the pumping station. If you ever want a tour or something, I'm sure the water department would gladly let you in and see this beautiful old steam pump. And with that, they were able to draw water from deeper in the aquifer or the underground you know, pool of water, so to speak. And they were, uh, didn't have to pump it directly from the pond. But inside that old pumping station, it's really beautiful. They, they keep it up, they keep polishing the brass railings, and um, it's really a, a pretty good engineering lesson. Steam gauge is there from that 1908 system. That's inside the present uh, Ruben pumping station. And there's a postcard of the pumping station. It's kind of hidden by the trees, but it just gives you an idea of uh, Cove Street and the Cove area, and you see the pumping station and the chimney sticking up in there. Let me catch up on my notes here. This is another view of a postcard of the pumping station taken from around the bend in the cove. You're looking at Cove Street there. And this, um, you're familiar with how the, the land juts out and wraps itself around and creates a cove. There's not all that much distance between the pumping station and the other side. And I'm told that they used to, in the summers, have a, a rope bridge that would um, connect the two, let people walk from the pumping station out to the the peninsula. And you'll see some uh, boats there. It was a, a pleasant area. Again, this is uh, around 1907-1908 era. This postcard is a bird's eye view. And again, here you can see where <clears throat> what I mean by it. it's a real picture, but then they color in the grass and things like that. But notice the ice houses at the corner, the large ice houses. Notice the uh, Boston Edison plant on Lake Avenue. You'll the pumping station, you'll notice, uh, most of it's hidden, but the chimney sticks up. And this is a, appropriately titled a bird's eye view from Horn Mountain. And you'll also notice a house on Cove Street, partially hidden by the trees, and that's so-called Pollard House. And the city actually had that built. At some point after the station opened in the 1870s, they had that house built, and it was the residence of the pumping station uh, operator, the chief of the pumping station operator. He lived there, his name is Edward Pollitt, and he was on the job there from 1890 to 1940. So he spent 50 years living in that house and working at the pumping station. The city, uh, the house stood until 1965 on Cove Street. And this is also a good segue, I think, into the next part of the water system, which was the, um, the reservoir. And this is a Lewis Linskett sketch of the reservoir. Part of the system involved not only building the pumping station, but having a reservoir. So they went up to the top of Hong Kong Mountain. They blasted out 13,000 cubic yards of fill. They used some of the natural rock. They 
found a, an area, they built a retaining wall around two other sides of it, and they had themselves a reservoir capable of holding six million gallons of water. Now today, if you look up to Rag Rock, you see the tank that's there. I live over the west side, you see the one up on they call West Spring Hill, up off of uh, the Revere Road area. Those each hold about four million gallons of water. So for comparisons, the reservoir held six million gallons of water, and it served the needs of women, really, from the 1870s up until the post-World War II era, up until the 1950s, when finally the, the baby boomers and the housing explosion that occurred in the 1850s forced the city to have to, to build additional reservoirs. But this was it for 70 or 80 years. And this is his version of it, and he did a pretty good job of sketching this. There were two uh, pipes, one to let water in and one to let water out. They could fill up the reservoir. There's a little gatehouse on the wall, and that was, um, it would operate the manual wheels that would open and shut the valves to let the water in and out. And once a year, at least, if not twice, they would drain the reservoir and clean it. And that was a tradition that continued, I think, right up to the 1960s or so. The reservoir was in play until 1986 was used, even with the other wells, uh, excuse me, the other tanks that were built on Ragwon. This reservoir was used until 1986. So, um, and they cleaned it annually. Some, several people would come up and said, I used to work for Public Works, and once a year, everybody would go up and drain the reservoir, and would go in there and scrub it and clean it and get rid of the, the weeds and all that stuff. So this is his version of it. We have a couple of nice old pictures of, of the reservoir. This is a picture taken from 1899, and you'll see the, the pipes in the bottom, the gatehouse in the corner, and there's the wall of the reservoir. It actually turned turned right to the right of the gatehouse and then came back down on the right hand side. We're looking north. If you went up the old road, it goes up from Wuben Parkway, it still goes up there, you can still walk up there, it's pretty jutted and pothole filled and all that. But if you walk up the old road, you come up by the big rock to your right, and that's, that's the old reservoir right there. There's an old, parts of an old fence still around it. There's some of Wuben officials in 1899, they were watching the Officials clean. Patrick uh, Patrick Crilly is the superintendent of the Ruben Water Works. He's on your left, and left to right, Patrick Crilly first, and then Frank Richardson, who was the superintendent of schools, and then further right is James Skinner, who was a wealthy uh, tannery owner and president of the first president of the Ruben Cooperative Bank. To next. Working left to right is Mayor Edward Johnson. He was a judge of the local district court at the time, former mayor, first mayor of the city. And on the far right is the second mayor of the city, George Bean. For the uh, part of the occasion in 1899, this photo was taken. And they're partially filling the reservoir up. And it gives you a little scale, too, because you can see the men on the top of the wall. It tells you how deep that was. Again, it held six million gallons of water. Note that um, gatehouse again. That gatehouse is gone, but the granite foundation of the great house, those big granite blocks beneath it, are still there today. And we have a picture. Well, this is this is a map of Ruben. Uh, actually, the, the date is not important. It's 1950, I think, or 1948. You'll see, you won't see a lot of streets over the west side, or farms that are there. But the reason I've included it is. Uh, when Winchester, which was part of Wuben, was first uh, created as a separate town, they just drew a line right across, a straight line, and they carved out Winchester from Wuben. But the reservoir ended up in Winchester, so they had to adjust the boundary line. And there was special uh, legislation by the uh, state legislature to adjust the boundary line to put the reservoir in Wuben once it was built. So that's why you see today on the map of Wuben the, that little V the bottom and encompass the reservoir area. We didn't want to have to ask for permission from Winchester for our water. <laughs> they might say no. Now we give them water of a different sort. Usually heavy rains. But they're good sports about it. Most of the time. 
Um, this is a picture taken from the 1950s. This is in the Farino collection. You can see some growth, and, but uh, notice how high the reservoir was kept. Um, this is a picture in the 1950s as well. They're actually cleaning the reservoir. They're putting in some chemicals to uh, keep the algae from growing in the reservoir. And if you look real closely on the boxes, it's ironically the name of the company was the Savem Products, S-A-V-E-M, Savem Products. And they were Savem. And this is a picture from 1965, I believe it was. And look how high the water level is now in the gatehouse. Okay, it's right up to the edge of the gatehouse. So if I was to just go back quickly, you have to try it. There you go. That's how high the water is, right up to the bottom of the gatehouse. Again, six million gallons. Uh, by the 1970s, uh, you know, the laws were changing. Uh, you couldn't build any more open air reservoirs for pollution reasons and birds flying overhead and all of that. So municipal water systems were kind of discouraged to have open air reservoirs. So, it, be, it was rapidly becoming a thing of the past and the state said either you either you build a cover over it or you build a or you abandon it. So eventually by nineteen eighty six the city stopped using the reservoir. It's still there though. I want to walk up. It's all overgrown. The other part of the water system of course was the addition of some wells. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the effect of, of drought conditions several times, but <clears throat> Essentially, in the 1920s, the city was still growing in the roaring 20s. The population was exploding again, and the city didn't have enough water. And there were drought conditions. The wells were going dry, and they commissioned, uh, they needed to find new water. So they commissioned a, ser a series of studies, and as a result of that, in the early 30s, the city built four or five new uh, wells, much deeper into the aquifer. And uh, three or four of them are still operating today. A couple of them went dry, but they've been replaced. But essentially, uh, a series of wells were built in the early 1930s, uh, supplemented by more wells in the late 50s and early 60s around the Hong Pond area. This was one design that, that one of the companies proposed, but they, you know, it's kind of ornamental and very decorative, and uh, this is just a well house. So the city was in the midst of the Depression. The city didn't have a lot of money, so they built a very economical version of that. These are the wells you see were built. Um, still looks nice, red brick, etc. These were wells B and D. All the wells were given letters, as you probably know, A, B, C, D, E, uh, F. F was added, I think, in 1961. And uh, well C, at the point it gone dry, they replaced it, they call it well C2. But just as, a, as an aside, when they got to the 1960s, the population was still expanding and they needed more water. The consultant said, you know, there may not be enough water in the Hong Pond aquifer for another well. So they started exploring the other side of the city, the uh, Abijona River aquifer, which is a completely separate aquifer. And of course, they poked two wells in the ground over there and they got the next letters. So they got G and H, and those were the infamous wells that caused all kinds of environmental and real sort of physical problems. But anyway, those are the wells built in the early 30s. Ironically, the city uh, has rebuilt uh, some over the years. They recently, in 2005, uh, built a new well, they replaced one of these, and uh, they went back to that old design. They had a few extra bucks lying around, and they went back to that old design. That's what you see if you walk on the other side of the parkway now, you'll see it. And it really does look nice. They did a nice job. And that's more or less what the original, that's what they went by, the old 1930s design. So it's kind of interesting. Let's talk about leisure and recreation a little bit. Let me catch up on my notes. Now I realize I can't read my notes. This is from the late 1800s, excuse me, yeah, late 1800s, 
And most of the pictures you're about to see are from that turn of the century, early 1900s, late 1800s. Obviously, canoeing, not for the, not for the working masses, but for those who had time, um, there was some kind of, there was always some nice boating that was going on in the pond. This is a, one of the uh, pictures that recognizes that. Uh, this is a copy of a license granted in 1888 by the Board of Selectmen to Charles Stevens to run a steam launch called the Winnie D. And uh, he got to operate that on Hong Pond for the season. It was signed by the Board of Selectmen. Interestingly, that some some, uh, it tells you that by the 1800s, the Irish had taken over politics in Wolverine, Kenny, Curran, Golden. Some of you may remember uh, Alden and Bernie Golden from East Wolverine. Uh, that was his grandfather, Michael Golden, who was on the board of selectmen. H.D. Murray, later on to become mayor, Hugh Murray, founded a, a leather manufacturing shops, the Murray Leather Shops. Uh, and there's the Winnie D. There's the Winnie D. Steam launch. Flying the, the waters of Hong Kong in the 1880s. Imagine that, huh? It held, I think, nine people. It, uh, that's Charles Stevens in the, in the rear of the ship. The Winnie D is etched into the front of the ship. It looks something like, uh, I don't know, it looks like the African Queen or something out of the Humphrey Bogart movie. I don't know, but, but it's kind of neat. You know, it's kind of a neat picture just to imagine that. that uh, Again, flying the waters of the pond. Uh, bicycling was a big craze in the 1890s, 1880s. The Tawanda Club actually started as a bicycle club. And this is a group of people from a bicycle club of the Tawanda Club. Uh, child's name, we don't have a first name, but his last name was Foster. And uh, they look like they're having fun on one of the they look like they're on the other side of the pond, the present-day parkway area. Uh, but it shows a on pond. And band concerts were, were neat. This is the Wooden Brass Band from around, uh, around 1900, on uh, possibly up by the, uh, the uh, on Pond House estate, which was then the Edward Hudson estate, or possibly uh, right across the street down on what we call Hudson's Grove today. So you can imagine uh, boating and band concerts and bicycling. People were using the pond much like we would use it today, just for any kind of fun recreational spend. A lot of postcards were made of the pond. This is one from uh, looking, looking south from just inside the bottom of Sturgis Street, the little path that ran across, ran along the pond edge. And the island is kind of hidden there on the right. Way in the distance is the, the uh, pumping station background. Uh, again, the pond level was four or five feet lower, so it was a little more shoreline, and this pathway was open most of the year. It had a nickname. Anybody remember its nickname? No? Come on, don't be bashful. No, this path. This path. Lover's Lane. Lover's Lane. That was the nickname of the path. There's a postcard version of it. This was a boathouse that was located at the Sturgis Street end of things, the bottom of the hill, so you could rent boats of all kinds. Kind of neat. And there was a canoe club on the Sturgis Street end of things. Out in front of the ice houses, they built the Inner Tooth Canoe Club. And my notes tell me that it was founded in 1886 and it operated until 1917, so 30, 31 years. Very fashionable. Ladies would get dressed up, you can imagine, a Sunday afternoon out on the pond in the Inner Two Canoe Club. They had a couple of different uh, clubhouses, or actually I think this was the original one and they added on to the back of it. And you'll see the ice houses in the background here. Again, this was located kind of on a spit of land which is now Ice House lot jutted out a little more than it does today into the pond. There's a view of it on the right side, and you'll see behind it the conveyor belt on the end to the ice houses and boats in the, in the back, in the foreground rather. Another postcard version of it. Quite an activity. And I think this is one of my favorite shots coming up. Canoe races. Isn't that great? Look at that. Um, Canoe races on Hong Kong. Uh, 
this is the shoreline of, of along Backman Arlington Road on your left. The ice houses are way down the corner of the Boston Ice Company are visible. This is coming north. They're racing north towards the Canoe House um, on Stritter Street. And you see the crowds lying the shores listening or looking at the race. Really neat picture. And there are all kinds of postcards. This is just another version of one in the Cove area along Cove Street. Now, what are we doing with the tannery picture in here at Long Point? Well, tanneries, of course, were up everywhere. And this is that down chamber that I mentioned earlier. It was pretty big. It stretched. Uh, this picture was taken from up around present-day Walcott Road up on the hill. In the background, there's some houses on Pleasant Street. It stretched all along what is today the Woman Parkway area and Water Street, between those two, where there's a nice grass area today. This is where the tannery was located. Again, we'll go back to that view that we showed earlier to see where it was located and it kind of traversed, uh, crossed over the brook and meandered its way through down to the pond. It was owned by these gentlemen. It was started by the, uh, the jolly looking fellow on the left, uh, <laughs> Abijah Thompson, and his son in law, Stephen Dow, operated it. Uh, Thompson died in the 1850s. Stephen Dow took it over and operated it until his own death in 1889. And then the tannery went on fire in 1893. 93 or 94, I think it was 93. And it was called the hottest fire Ruben has seen in a long time. And it completely destroyed the tannery. And it was never rebuilt on the site. They, they, the company later opened the shop on Cross Street and bought one of the buildings on Cross Street. But uh, it opened up the possibility for many people that viewed it as a chance to create a roadway. Now the Tannery Fire, they said, was the 1893-94 era. The Metropolitan District Commission had just been formed, the MDC, had just been established by the State House, uh, State Legislature in 1892. Uh, Boston had just seen a series of beautiful parks designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, the golden necklace of parks in Boston. So there was a lot of talk, and it was an era of, of many people wanting more green space as, as things became more urbanized. Uh, some themes, they just continue to repeat themselves. But this was an era when that theme was very prevalent. And one mayor after another, one city council after another, tried to get the MDC to extend their parkway system and come up into movement uh, to no avail throughout the 1890s. The MDC was building parkways in and around Boston and surrounding suburbs and looping them all together and creating many of the beautiful parkways that are still with us today. Uh, and movement just couldn't get the necessary support or funding to have them extended all the way into movement. But it had come up to Medford and Winchester. Uh, this was one design that was actually proposed in 1898 of a, a grand looping boulevard from Winchester. It's kind of hard to see, but you'll see Han Pond on the left-hand side there. And it would have gone up the left side of the pond through where the, where the uh, tannery was, up under the shadows of Rag Rock, up by Forest Park in Central Square, north of Central Square, looped itself around, come back down East Woodland, roughly where Wood Street is today, kind of meander over to where Washington Street is and loop its way back. This was one proposal that was seriously considered but ultimately rejected by the State House and the MDC. And it took a long time to get um, the roadway to the MDC to agree to extend their roadway system. And they finally did. In 1913, uh, they finally did. This was the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, it was held at the corner of Pleasant Street and Water Street, where they started construction on the Woman Parkway in 1913. Uh, that is, uh, I believe, former Mayor Davis, who was one of the mayors that tried to get the system uh, with the shovel. That's mayor at the time was uh, Bill Henschen, who later became a judge, longtime judge in the Woman District Court, with the in the middle of the lighter coat and the bowler uh, hat. And peering over his shoulder is uh, Mayor, former Mayor Hugh D. Murray, uh, who tried to get in the picture because he tried to get the parkway also. And uh, there's another picture of the leading 
leading people in the uh, city at the time. Mayor Henschey in the bowler hat, that's your representative, uh, jo uh, Joseph Henry Parker with the shovel. He was instrumental in getting it. Poor Mayor Murray, he got behind the American flag. He didn't get his picture taken too long. But the parkway, and so it was constructed and it was officially an MDC roadway and it extended in a, in a straight line. There was no looping boulevard, but at least it was a, a parkway that was built. It was beautifully constructed. Uh, all the trees were laid out at a certain distance from each other. It was really some thought went into it. These pictures are from the 1930s. And it became a, a beautiful roadway uh, traversed by roads. It was maintained uh, by the MDC, just to bring the story current, um, all the way up to the 1950s. Uh, but it never connected to anything else. It kind of became the end of the line. So if you had a problem there, it was the MDC police that was supposed to respond. But their nearest headquarters was in Medford. Uh, the maintenance was done by the MDC, not the city, and their nearest place was in Medford. So it kind of, you know, in the thinking of the day, it kind of got that end of the line mentality. It was kind of left over, we'll get to it when we can. And a serious movement arose in the 1950s by women officials to try to get the city to take it over. Uh, unsuccessfully at first, uh, and then in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a serious effort put forth by uh, Mayor Gilgun, John Gilgun, um, who thought the city could do a much better job of maintaining it than the MDC was at the time. Um, and he finally, the MDC didn't want to let it go. They, it was a really political issue. You might say, well, why, why would they care? They were afraid that if they let this section go, that other cities and towns would say, hey, we want our section, and we want this section. And pretty soon there'd be no MDC roadway system. So they fought it tooth and nail, and it took a a tie-breaking vote in the United States, in the uh, Massachusetts Senate, and uh, a lot of personal persuasion by Mayor Joe Gunn uh, on the doorstep or in the home of Governor Volpe, who lived in Winchester at the time, uh, to finally sign it. So the city finally got it in 1961. Actually, Mayor Joe Gunn is here tonight. Mayor Joe Gunn, want to wave to him? Want to take a nice round of applause? Mayor Joe Gunn, thank you. Almost. Uh, almost 50 years ago. And there was more vision and foresight and planning that went on after that uh, by two people in particular. One was uh, the mayor, Bernie Golden. I mentioned the former alderman, Bernie Golden, from East Wolf, and this was his uncle. Uh, he was mayor for four years, 1919 to 1922. And to his left is a fellow, it's a terrible picture, I would admit, it's the only one I could find on of a man named Heber Cluley, kind of an odd first name. It's not Herbert, it's actually Heber. He was a landscape architect. He lived on Pleasant Street opposite the, uh, uh, sort of down the street from the parkway, a little bit at the corner of Valley Road. And he had a plan, and he had a plan, and others joined with him. And Mayor Golden supported it to acquire the land of the Boston Ice Company. Remember me saying that they kind of quit the business at the south end of the pond around 1915 or so. And Cluley and Golden and others said, let's buy that land because it's important that the city acquire the shoreline of the pond for future planning, for recreation, for passive recreation, for parks. Uh, and he pushed the plan and he then designed, uh, the city did it. They, they purchased some acreage, acreage from the Boston Ice Company in 1919. They purchased 27 acres on the west side of the pond all surrounding the parkway area from private landowners in, in 1922. And then even after Mayor Golden left office, they acquired the Hudson Grove area opposite Hudson Street from the heirs uh, from the, uh, after Mrs. Hudson had died. Uh, all that shoreline along the back of Allington Road, all of this was acquired in the 1920s. And there was a lot of vision, foresight, and planning. Cluley laid out a plan, to, they planted about 100 trees on the right-hand side of Arlington Road, on, on that Arlington Road shoreline. Um, and he also said, you know, we can create a little beach area in the corner where the ice houses used to st stand. So he said, you know, he said we can create a park in the area and a little park area up on the high ground on Cove Street, and we can create a beach at the southeast corner. And uh, due to their planning, we had Foley Beach and Lynch Park. 
Now, this is a view, those bath houses that you see here were in the, uh, where the ice houses stood, at the corner of Arlington Road and Lake Avenue. The beach stretched, the initial beach, 1922, it opened. It was a much smaller beach, roughly where the bathhouses were. It was an old temporary bathhouse. Um, and then in the 1920s, you know me saying there were drought conditions, and they had to pump water directly from the pond for many of those years. And during those years that they pumped water from the pond, they couldn't have kids swimming in the pond. So the beach was closed for most of the 1920s, off and on. It would be open a little bit. Finally, by the early 1930s, you remember me saying that they had solved the water problem. They built four or five new wells, so they got plenty of water. They didn't have to draw water from the pond anymore during the hot summer days, and they could reopen the beach. And a major effort was made to expand the beach. They built new bathhouses, and the beach wrapped itself all the way around from opposite Buckman Street, all the way over to where the present day parking lot is today including on the other side of the outlet of Hong Kong Brook. And this is one of those pictures. This is a picture taken in the mid-1930s. It was called Foley Beach, and the area around it was also called Lynch Park. And it was the heyday of Foley Beach, beginning in the 1930s. Uh, 1933, they had a rededication of it. And that's another view that you saw earlier, if you were here early. Uh, this picture was also in the Times. It's a view taken in the 1930s. It was a postcard picture. Uh, it just gives you an idea of, this is looking now from opposite, opposite Buckland Street, around the corner, around past the outlet. On the, on the left you can see the uh, red brick Boston Edison building across the street. Foley Beach was named after Edward Foley. This was a 1922 news article regarding the naming of the beach. He had uh, died in the war, in World War I. I saw this and I had to, um, I wanted to put it in anyway, but ironically, just uh, as an aside, on the left of that article, you'll see that it was the funeral of Charles Burdett, who lived at 7 Mishawam Road. So Charles Burdett was the founder of Burdett College. He was a, originally opened a uh, penmanship school, and later developed into a, a full-fledged business school. And he was very fond of uh, calligraphy, a beautiful scripted uh, writing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I think most of you have. And if you'll notice, uh, the house at 7 Michelin Road, the next time you drive by, the home of the Historical Society now, uh, look up and, and you'll see the woodwork that he designed when he had that house built. Beautifully scripted uh, curly cues and all, all those things. Uh, but anyway, ironically, it was the same article here. Foley grew up on Lake Avenue, one of five brothers. Uh, went off to serve in World War I with a bunch of women guys who were mostly in Company F and Company G of the 101st Mass Regiment. He wrote this letter uh, from in, in May of 1918 under a heavy strain, gassed, raided, bombarded. And then he wrote, in this game, if a fellow has luck with him, he'll be all right. But should one come over with his name on it, meaning a shell, he's done it. It's all in the game, and if a fellow's number is up, it's all off with him. Edward Foley was killed in, in August, excuse me, in July, two months after he wrote this letter, in action at uh, Chateau Thierry in France. He was age 18. So he was kind of a, a neighbor of the pond. He no doubt uh, grew up down there. Spent many days down there, so it was appropriate to maybe name it after him. And also, um, like many World War I casualties, they were buried fatalities. They were buried uh, in France initially, but then after the war, an effort was made to, um, to rebury them at home. And he was actually reburied in April 1922, so it was kind of fresh in everyone's mind. They had, re they had found his body. They had brought his body back. He was buried at, oh, Brian, I hit the wrong button. Can you help me with that? He was buried in uh, Calvary Cemetery in April 1922 when they named the beach after him in July. Don't go far. You 
stay right there. Lynch kind of gets overlooked sometimes. Charles Lynch was a buddy of Edward Foley. He was also in Company F. He was also 18 years old when he was struck and killed in action in uh, actually a a couple of months before Foley in May of 1918. He grew up at uh, 24 Stoddard Street, also down the south end of the pond. Uh, one of his fellow Ubernites wrote a letter home. Uh, William Carroll said he was out of patrol. Uh, as far as I could learn, he was just making for a dugout if they were just a few minutes earlier, the poor kid would still be with us. And he was happy as ever that day. So very sad. He was actually killed in, uh, for the same blast of the same shell killed another Lubanite that was with him named Charles Rupp, R-U-P-P, -P, from uh, Pleasant Street. So Foley Beach, Lynch Park, again, that's another view in the 1930s. It looks like an empty beach, uh, but it gives you an idea of the scope of the beach. And it really looks completely empty until you realize there's somebody on the diving board. Do you see him there? Yeah. Looks a little shallow to me to be diving. Maybe he was uh, posing to the picture, I don't know. But uh, many of you will start to remember this kind of view. I, I just had to show this picture again. Because for those of you who grew up in the South End and who lived at the beach during the summer, you know, these were the kind of crowds that you were normally talking about um, day to day. And you know, even though I kept saying, you know, preparing for this photo, I kept the program, I kept saying to people, hey, have you got any pictures? They'd say, oh, I grew up there every day, I was there. Got any pictures? No. You know, got any pictures? No. So finally somebody says to me, we didn't have cameras back then. You know, it's not like today when every kid has them on a cell phone. You know, they didn't have cameras. This was the depression. This was the heart of the depression. 1933, 34, 35, 36, the heart of the depression. So, but people have told me, I'm just tip touching the tip of the iceberg here, I know, so I'm leaving people out, but life got it. Ski Duong, Roger Hill, Happy Joyce, Queenie, Cute Higgins, Bob Mobs, Jim Brennan, who later taught at the high school for many years, Austin Garvey, also a teacher, Bill Ward from the South End, Yavi Foley, John O'Rourke, Jack O'Rourke, Bill Stitchy Effort. Bill is with us tonight. Bill, raise your hand. Nice and Billy, Billy Flaherty, Dick Roach, others, uh, Fred Hand, Slugger Dolan, uh, and others and others and others. Johnny Henley, Bill Moran, and I think they're here tonight as well. Matrons, everybody mentioned in the 1930s, Maggie Darby, Maggie Hessian Darby. She was the mother hen. Uh, later on, people would mention the later 40s, Mary Reddy, and I'm sure there were others. Refreshments, you went to Abby Rollo's store at the corner of Buckman Street. Also, some people called it Buck Store. Later on in the 40s and 50s and 60s, you went to Bill and Hazel's hot dog stand. Some people remember Tony Push-Up's ice cream shop. Who remembers some of these? Raise your hand if you remember some of these. Huh? Come on, don't be bashful. There you go. Okay. Annual swimming meets, water carnivals, swimming races, diving off the dive board. Lots of, lots of great memories. Having fun in a different attire. They'd have a field day every now and then. This is from 1935 or 36. Um, one, of the, one of the few pictures from that era that we actually found. And the reason we found it is my mother had it. Okay, okay I'm going to move across the... We've, we've been able to identify most of these people, by the way. This is, this is probably a field day of sorts at the end of the season. They would have a, you know, a lot of fun days and this was kind of a dress up day. On the left hand side in the very front row, there's two little kids, uh, the Strike twins, Robert and Roger Strike. Well, Roger and Robert Strike. I don't know who's who. The little girl next to them is Shirley Sullivan Earhart, is a married name. Behind Shirley with the top hat, the ringmaster is Billy Sullivan. We have a long time Daily Times, Billy Sullivan. Uh, moving along the front row is uh, with her, with another top hat, is Marion Sullivan. Behind her, with her face partially hidden, is my mother, Mary McElhinney. Moving across the front is Trisha Reel, Trisha McElhinney Reel. This little girl, right here now, 
is uh, Pat Scally, Pat McGeckling Scally, has passed away recently. The boy with the Zorro hat on, on the, the flowing robes, is Jackie Melanson. In the upper left, starting with the back row, way over there, starting there is uh, my grandmother Winnie Macklin, my father's mother. The boy next to him, we have a little dispute on. We have either either Jack or Rook, or Jack Gordon. So it's either Jackie or Rook or Jack Gordon. I got that correctly. The one in the uh, Groucho Marx disguise is. Uh, this is uh, Albina Johnson. There's Maggie Hessian Doherty next to her, the matron. Next to her with a false face is uh, Nora Sullivan. Next to Nora is uh, Jean Lally. No, excuse me, is uh, Roseanne Kerwin Wright. Next to her is Jean Lally. She's here this evening. Then we have uh, Mary Kerwin. Helene Sullivan Shekowitz, partially hidden, she's here this evening. In front of her is Mary Diamond. And the boy up in the corner is uh, Johnny, excuse me, Jimmy Melanson. So those are the ones we were able to identify. Some are still with us, some unfortunately are not, but um, time has a way of robbing us of, of those wonderful moments. Um, this is something you'd never consider today. Huh? <laughs> When's the last time you used a used bathing suit? Raise your hand. Used okay. Uh, but this was the Depression. And uh, this was, uh, there was a bathing suit ride. And the article goes on to say how many of the kids come down just in their, basically in their underwear, or they wait for somebody to come out of the water. And give them their baby, their wet babies. I'm not making this up. This is in the article. Uh, so I hope this brings back some memories. Does anybody want to admit to have wearing a used baby suit? No? And it, uh, actually, the person behind the drive was Maggie, Maggie Dari. Uh, and she said, you know, this, we can use these suits, so some kids just don't have them. So uh, a good person. And, uh, sign of the times, the depression. Tough times. Just another view from the 1930s. Uh, you can see how Lake Avenue is coming down on your right hand side there, and how expansive the beach area was. This is well beyond the brook now. This is well beyond where the Scally Dam is. And it wrapped, the beach wrapped itself all the way around there. Lots of races, uh, headlines from the Times from 1940, 1941, uh, different names that you might remember. They had all kinds of different races of different yardage, 25 yards, 50 yards, 440 yards. You know, Bill Stewart, Barbara Keating, Esther McCauley, Frank Urovich, Edward Melanson, half mile races, Barbara Keating. Um, there's all kinds of names in here for different categories, under 12, under 10, under 11. Um, Ninth annual meet was 1941, so they started this 1933, I think, counting 33, which is when I indicated it was rededicated. It was a big new bathhouses. So they had these annual uh, events, usually um, uh, sometimes at the end of the summer, sometimes in the middle of the summer. How many remember those? Remember swimming in those? Yeah, come on, raise those hands. Wow, that's great. They also had a, a uh, seven mile, seven mile swim around the perimeter of the pond five times, all the way down Sturgis Street, all the way down around the island, around the back, five times. This is the result uh, of the 1940 race. Roger Hill, many of you remember him, he's a local life guy, he came in second. Nine people uh, finished, 15 started the race, the article goes on to say, nine people finished. Seven mile race, that's, that's pretty good. We're gonna jump to um, 1940s. We found this cartoon from 1947, or I should say cartoon, it's a comic book cartoon, but uh, written, done by Jim Dobbins. He was a pretty good, uh, pretty good cartoonist. Many will remember him, a local guy. And he uh, captured some of the lifeguards here from 1947 
on the left, Stitchy Etheridge, who's here this evening. Jackie Forbes, who unfortunately, he lives in Quincy, and he had a, a death of a uh, kind of a close family, not immediate family member, but enough that he had to uh, travel up to Maine uh, for a uh, funeral tomorrow. So Jackie Forbes was going to come. He was uh, going up on the left, Frank Callahan on the middle of top, uh, Winchester's Skits Carroll, and on the right with the uh, helmet, Ski Dulong, Melvin Ski Dulong, who was there forever. And in the middle front, Jackie O'Rourke, John O'Rourke, who was the head lifeguard in 1947. Ski, if you read these captions, uh, the caption down below him says he's, he's been there almost as long as the beach. <laughs> and this was 1947, so uh, he was there for decades, decades at the beach, Ski Dulong. And uh, top, he was quite a swimmer. On the top of the caption, above his head, you'll see uh, he's credited with uh, 97 rescues already in 1947. 97 confirmed rescues. Ski Dulong. Ski's wife, Maggie, is here. Maggie, did you raise your hand? Right. Come on, raise your hand. This is a, a little more inclusive than just lifeguards, but it, it has some lifeguards in it. This is the following year, 1948. It's a familiar, again, a Dobbins sketch in the outer circle on the left, starting with the uh, far left over here. And going up on that circle, we've got Fred Hammond, who's a lifeguard. We've got Jack Forbes, who was the head lifeguard out there. We've got Al Diamond. We've got uh, Dick Roach. We've got Ski Duwam again with that. And then we've got other people in other areas of the city that were fulfilling, uh, working for the Recreation Department that, that year. Ed Foley at the Wading Pool, which was Green Street. Uh, you'll see Yabi Foley, who was at Fleming Field that year. And going back on the circle, Bill Ward. Bill Flaherty was a lifeguard. Uh, Jimmy Tedesco was the recreation director in the middle. Mary Reddy. Over there was the matron at the pond that year. And various other and sundry people and the members of the recreation commission down along the, the bottom of the photo. Okay, you ready now? We just, we don't have just cartoon images of some of these guys. We've got a real picture of some lifeguards. You ready? Okay. Ladies, hold on to your seats. 1948. Okay. This is a G-rated show. 1948. We've got left to right, uh, Ski Du Long, Melvin Ski Du Long, in the One Piece suit. Then we've got Billy Flaherty, longtime educator in both the Woman and the Bill Ricker school system. Then we've got Dick Roach, again moving left to right. Then we've got Jimmy Tedesco, who was the recreation director that summer. Then we've got uh, Jack Forbes, who was kind of disappointed he couldn't make it, but understandably so. Then we've got. Uh, Get my notes here. Uh -oh. I think it's Fred Hammond. Fred Hammond. And then we've got Albie Diamond on the back, on the right side from Lake Avenue. 1948 lifeguards. Okay, all settled down now? Okay. Um, take a look over Ski's shoulder. You can see the size of the island and all the trees out there. Sometimes the, the things in the background are better. Ski was quite a swimmer. This is a headline from 1941. He won the uh, annual Boston Light Swim. They would swim from Boston Light, which is way off Boston Harbor, to South Boston. It was a nine mile swim. Ski won it. And the conditions were not, not the best. Roger Hill uh, had to uh, drop out. Uh, the winning time was three hours and 17 minutes swimming in the water, nine miles. 
That was uh, Ski Dulon. I'm going to break away from the beach just for a second. This is a 1930s, early, early 1930s picture looking from Hudson Grove down on Ellington Road. Uh, yeah, the pond was very high at that point for this picture, but it normally wasn't that high. You'll see the uh, chimney of the Edison plant way in the background. And there were no, um, this was before the WPA projects of the mid 30s. The WPA, during the Depression, the Works Progress Administration, federal government program where the government hired, let cities and towns direct various projects of public works improvement. And the government paid for the uh, manpower, they paid for the labor and the salaries. And the cities and towns paid a portion of uh, the materials, those are the shovels and the rocks and whatever. But most of the money, most of it was a federal stimulus project of sorts. And one of the projects chosen was the shoreline of Hon Pond. And the result was in 1935 and 36, uh, completed in 36, beautiful stone walls, field stone walls, all the way along, not only Hudson Grove, but all along, the way along the shoreline of the pond down to the beach. Um, and they still survive, although, albeit the, the, the ones under the water now are pretty broken up. But this is a view of a postcard from 1936 after the walls were completed. This is opposite Hudson Street now. And you'll notice five different levels that were created way up top by the, the house, the Mourn House, and then there's a level below that, a level below that, a level below that, and finally the level along the shoreline. Look at the beautiful field stone walls that right out of the water. And uh, even though this is a postcard, it's, real, it's a real photo. And most of those walls are still there, except that the point having been raised, the ones in, in the lower level have really been obliterated and broken up over the years. They also built a wall at the south end of the pond um, along the pumping station and stretching from the pumping station over to the beach. And the little top of that wall is visible here. This is a 1938 photo. And again, look at the island, the size of the island. We're going to take a break here to see this 19, well, we don't have a picture of it, but we had to put this in. Does anybody remember seeing this plane land in the pond? Wow. Okay. 1938, they, the nation, uh, the Postmaster General James Farley in Washington came up with a program to try to, uh, it was actually a stimulus program, to try to get revenue for the various airlines, the commercial airlines who had seen business plummet in the 30s, in the Depression. Nobody was traveling. You weren't traveling, taking vacations in the 30s. Commerce was off, business was off. So one of the things they came up with was to celebrate the 20th anniversary of airmail, which had started in 1918. Uh, they got they, a big push that every city and town in the country, every small village and hamlet, every rural outpost, to get everybody to mail an airmail letter. So every city and town had uh, various contests and a real push to do it. And uh, a lot of people had a success to mail us letter, and a lot of people um, mailed an airmail letter that week. And this, uh, this is a commemorative uh, envelope that shows a picture of a plane. The postmaster in Woburn was Philip Gallagher. He had been mayor of the city in 1930. He was later appointed postmaster, so he decided it would be fun to have a pond, uh, a plane land on the pond. So uh, they did. And, they, and everybody put, uh, it was also, by the way, it was National Airmail Week, but uh, the, the American Legion National Commander happened to be from Wuben, Dan Darby, so they put, they put a commemorative uh, picture of him on there as well. So 10,000 airmail letters went into the Wuben, went out with that plane. They actually opened an office on the shores of Hong Kong, an official post office for the day, and you could bring down the last minute and get your airmail stamped and ready to go. So it's kind of an odd uh, little quirk, but the plane landed and took off from Hong Kong carrying 10,000 handmail letters. Here's another commemorative envelope. I, I like this one too because of, well, the date is more clear there, May 19th, 1938. And uh, look, it was addressed to somebody at Scott's Tobacco Store. Everybody remember that? Um, 
Walnut Street, right? It was usually cold. You'd usually get there early in the morning and some people would camp out the night before. And uh, you'd always freeze. You'd always freeze, as I recall. But it was fun. And lots of boats out in the pond. Um, I like this picture because uh, not so much for the fishing. Yeah, you can still see the pumping station too. But look up on the mountain. You can see the corner of the reservoir wall and the gatehouse. Remember the gatehouse? There's the reservoir wall where it turned. Opening day again from the 50s. The chimney of the pumping station I think was struck by lightning in around 1938. Half of it came down. They didn't really use it at that point. But it stayed like this until um, I think the, the mid, mid 1960s, sort of half a chimney. And then around 1970, I think they added on the, an addition to the pumping station and they got rid of the rest of the chimney. You can also see the Pollitt House in this photo on the right, up on Cove Street. And you can also see the Edison Company to the left of the pumping station. This is uh, part of that uh, wall that was constructed in 1938. It stands right out there. This is right near the pumping station. This is a, a different day because the weather is so much different. They don't have their jackets on or anything, but uh, it's one of my favorite photos. Anybody recognize anybody in there? I don't have any names. There's their trophy. Isn't that a great photo though? It's like a Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn type, uh, type photo. It really brings back, hopefully, some, some great memories. Very proud kids. Anybody recognize anybody? No? It's not me. The 50s uh, saw too much water at the pond on different occasions. There were a couple hurricanes in 54. There were heavy rains in the spring sometimes that would flood the area. This is a, I'm not sure whether this is a post-hurricane photo or not, but Holy Beach here was underwater. And uh, this is a springtime event. The leaves are off the trees pretty much and uh, too much water. The beach was uh, obliterated by, by water. The lifeguard stands away out in the in the water, as you can see. They were, sometimes they were out there anyway, but they're way out this time. And this is going over the causeway area, which was pretty flooded, and uh, it's the Farina. These are all Farina photos. Captured that pretty well. And then there was not enough water. Um, the late 50s and the early 1960s saw drought-like conditions. This is a famous uh, drought, 1957, a series of photos here capturing various images of how low the water was. That's Foley Beach. Way to the right is the sand, and the flagpole is in the middle left of the photo. See the flagpole? So this is the southerly end. It wasn't even reaching the outlet. The island was very low. Again, Fleming Field is in the background. And you can see even uh, how low it is on the, other, on the Arlington Road side. This is looking from the island out north. Uh, pretty severe drought. Looking from the island north again. And looking out to the island, which you could actually walk out to. And there you go. Walk out to the island. 1957. Any ideas who these girls are? Rosa Tatucci, maybe? No. <laughs> Kathy Lucero? No. Okay, no. Maybe uh, uh, Jim Glenn, who was here, uh, who provided these photos in the, this series of photos, um, thought one of them was the McLaugh, Dr. McLaughlin's uh, daughter, I don't know. But again, this is from the Farino collection, so if you recognize yourself and you want a copy of this, uh, please see me afterwards. There's the causeway, completely dry, bone dry. 
That's what it looked like, two big culverts underneath from the lagoon area to the main pond. This is looking back from the pond area into the causeway. So now we're going to get to the 60s. We're going to, we're going to still see some use of Foley Beach, but we're going to say goodbye to old Foley Beach. This photo was in 1962. The beach, as you can see, is still very active. Um, it's starting to change a bit. It's starting to shrink a little bit in size. And, you know, times were changing. People didn't realize it. In the 30s, everybody went to the beach all summer. In the 50s and 60s, people started going to Hampton Beach for a couple of weeks uh, here and there. They started gaining second homes and vacation homes and going up to the lakes. So there were fewer and fewer people very incrementally um, using the beach. Still active, but, you know, things were changing. There's a couple of shots on, on the left in uh, Sheila and Priscilla Arsenal of Francis Road at Foley Beach. And on the right is the Historical Society's own John Palladino <laughs> from Ash Street. John, so I couldn't resist uh, embarrassing him even further. <laughs> His mother Nancy is here. Nancy, I know times are tough, but you should buy the kid a pail next time. <laughs> using Dixie cups to make sand passes. That's Johnny Pelletier. Johnny's here this evening as well. So, uh, this is from 1965. You can still see the hot dog stand up on the right hand side. Yeah. Not too many people there. Um, the droughts continue in the early 60s. This is from 1963. Not quite as bad as 57, but there were a series of years there where there were really uh, low, some severe drug conditions. There's Pug Muse's store. He had a little beach. He was quite an entrepreneur, actually. This is on the Sturgis Street end. Show you how much things had dried up. He would uh, have a little ice cream stand there, and little beach area, he would rent boats to you if you wanted to rent a boat. There's some boats in the background, but they weren't going anywhere on that day. There's a kid from Beacon Street, I forget his name now. That's looking along Allington Road uh, from Sturgis Street going up, completely dry at that end of the pond. This is 1963 in the fall. Looking down Allington Road, you can see the bath houses at the very end. That's how low things were. This whole, this whole drought, series of droughts had an effect on the city's ability to draw water from its wells. Uh, the population had just uh, gone crazy in the 50s with the baby boomers. As I mentioned earlier, the city was adding a couple of new wells to the system in the late 50s and early 60s uh, to draw more water. And the, it wasn't so much that they drew water, the wells didn't really draw water from the pond, but a full pond would, would, would kind of act as a sponge and would keep the pressure on the underground aquifer so the water would be drawn out in a much uh, greater rate. So if the pond wasn't as full, the pressure on the underground aquifer wasn't as great and it created a uh, lack of water being able to be pumped out drinking water use. So the theory, at least, was that uh, if you raised the level of the pond, you could create more pressure and get better production, daily production, out of your water wells. So the plan was hatched in the mid-60s to raise the level of the pond. And it was. They held back the water as much as possible from the, from the dam, from the outlet and um, they raised the level of the pond four or five feet on average. And of course, during the spring season of the heavy rains, that would mean that most of the shoreline, the old shoreline was gone, and during the summer months, some of it would return. So Foley Beach uh, shrank a little, and it got a little less, less area, and it wasn't being used quite as much, and it wasn't quite the same, and the thought, uh, it really wasn't as usable, so the thought occurred to build another beach across 
on the other side of the pond. And that's really what led to the, it's all kind of connected between the water wells and the level of the pond and moving Foley Beach. So um, there's just another shot from the 19, early 1960s. You could walk out to the island again, the reservoir area. How much of the wall was exposed uh, in the area around the reservoir? I mean, excuse me, the pumping station. You can still see the uh, Pollard House up there on the right. And here's Foley Beach. This is a, a great sim symbolic picture because it's nobody there. Uh, if you look real high, you can see a maintenance truck in the middle of the picture down on the beach, emptying the barrels, but there's nobody there. And uh, so they moved, and the bathhouses were kind of looking pretty tired. And so they moved the beach. So we sent a load to a new Foley Beach. It opened in 1968 on the other side of the pond. If you are walking around the pond today, you come to the Lions Park area, uh, where there's a, a lion there, a very manicured, grassy area with lots of walking paths to it. And there's a little spit of beach there. Well, that's the remnants of from this beach, that's where this beach was located. On the left, you'll see the parkway continuing, and then eventually to the causeway. The causeway had to get completely rebuilt. It was completely swamped once they raised the level of the pond. They brought in a lot of fill from uh, in back in the bowling room and blasting out the uh, Nanny Goat Hill up in Wuben Center, uh, creating a parking lot up there. They took a lot of that fill and they, they built up the, the causeway area. Um, and they opened this beach. And it was, you know, it got some use. It's a pretty popular. Another little version of it. Parking lot behind it was where the, the lion is today, where all the manicured uh, grass park parts are today. And uh, it actually was used right on up through 1980. So hard to believe, it's fairly recently. But uh, it was used in the summer. And uh, in 1981, the decision was made to close the beach. There had been some uh, fiscal constraints. Uh, Proposition two and a half had come in, but more importantly than that, I think uh, the city, the, the you know, city and town of Burlington, had constructed a sewer line uh, down through the pond to handle sewage from the expanding west side of the city and all, most of Burlington, and it went all the way along. Arlington Road, and by the late 1970s, it was starting to uh, surcharge on heavy, rainy days. So uh, the water quality was being questioned more and more, and you know, rightly so, and it just didn't make sense. So Foley Beach came to a close. I think 1980 was the last summer that it was open. But in the 1970s, in an effort to kind of bring back days of yore, a fellow named Ski Doolin said, let's have an old-fashioned swimming meet. And so they came up with this uh, event called the Biathlon. It started in 1973. They swam about a mile and a half. They ran. They went back in the water and swam. They went back out and ran, and they swam. And Ski insisted that they start at the old Foley Beach, which was the old beach at that point. It wasn't being used anymore after 1968. These are the steps at uh, the bottom of the steps are still there today. And these are the winners of the second annual Biathlon 1974, uh, left to right. Roy Doucette in the back row. Roy Doucette, Bobby Cannon was the winner. Carl Torres, Recreation Director, remember. And Ian Bradshaw, uh, now Ian Riccadelli, was the winner in the girls' division. In the front, on the left, is Tom Mansour, Recreation Director member, the Recreation Commission member, I should say, and Ski Duong, still with the hat. <laughs> and this is the, these are the winners of the 1975 award. Uh, Louis Ferrillo, Recreation Director on the far left. Lorraine Swimer, Recreation Member on the far right. Ski is on the left, kneeling, and Tom Yansour. And uh, some winners, I actually have their names on through quickly. Let's see. Uh, the kids are from left to right, Billy Savoy, Mike B. B. Zenz, Bobby Cannon won again, Joan Callahan was the girls' winner, Terry Murphy, and Elizabeth Wells. So, uh, 
Uh, they continued that for another few years, 76, the bicentennial, it was a big event, but it kind of petered out after that. We're going to leave the, the summer on this nice hot day and just talk a little bit about winter. Some of these slides, if you were here a year and a half ago, you would have seen again. But it's worth noting again, I think you'll get a kick out of them. There was always uh, fun on the pond, and in the, mostly in the area near the pond. So you could shovel off an area and skate or play hockey. That was always doable. Winter skating was always uh, a lot of fun. This is from the 1950s. This is a Freo photograph. This is a blow up of that. Just, and again, even, even today, it doesn't seem to uh, freeze over as much as it did even 50 or 60 years ago. Maybe it's my imagination, I don't know. In the uh, 1940s, they had a ski jump built up on the mountain. And uh, they had a ski jumping contest. Attracted 3,000 people. They actually built a little runway, built up a little ski jump, and uh, off they went. 1941, they did the same thing. In a two ski jump, they called it. One pond mountain. 102 feet was the winning jump. That's not bad, I don't think. Then the war came, World War II broke out in December 1941. That's the last uh, evidence we have that there was any ski jumping on Horn Pond Mountain. But when I did this program a year and a half ago, I said, I don't think it's still there. And somebody came up to me afterwards and they said, Oh, yes, it is. And I've got pictures of it. Uh, a fellow named Mark Rosenblum. From, uh, who lives in Winchester now, very attached to Hong Kong Mountain. And he shared with me these photos, and it is still there. You can still see it. You have to climb up the mountain. But you can still see the remnants. This is uh, a photo that was taken about two years ago now of the ski jump. That's what you're looking at. You're kind of facing uh, Winter Pond in Winchester. There's the runway. I mean, all the trees have obviously grown in over the years, but it was a pretty, uh, if you walk up the roadway to the big rock at the top, and you circle right below that rock, you'll find this uh, ski jump area. There's the end of it. Still today, two years ago. So, not bad. But really, um, winter activities occurred both at the country club, which is nearby, and on Hong Kong Mountain. And uh, actually, Mayor Gilgun, who I mentioned earlier, really said, why don't we use the country club uh, for winter activities in addition to golf? And so many of you will remember that they developed a little rope tow, uh, they developed a toboggan chute, and uh, as you can see from the story headline, 3,000 people there on a weekend in 1961, 60, 62, 63. Um, great area. The, the, the slope was up on where the, from where the parking lot is today, up above the country club, down out onto the, where the first fairway is today. That was the slope that they used. Um, there's the toboggan chute on the left there, and a rope tow on the right. And it was a lot of fun. There's some toboggan queens, <laughs> you know call them. And Jay Cantillon on the left, left to right. Uh, Joanne Flaherty, Jean Cantillon, and Janet Pacora. And you're looking out over the first fairway. The first green would be way down the end there. Up on the left is all woods, now it's fairway drive. Uh, a lot of fun in those toboggans. And you got in the chute and you're ready to go. And uh, we got left to right Linda Johnson, Debbie Wynn. Not quite sure who the third person was, and Barbara McCarthy in the back. And it was a lot of fun. People queued up, you dragged your toboggan back up, and uh, that's at the top of the parking lot of where the country club is. But then things changed a bit. There was a little bit of uh, political turmoil. Is that a fair statement, Mayor Gilgan? Is that a fair statement? A little bit of change in change in philosophy, and uh, things happened so that uh, the country club was not used anymore, but uh, things shifted to Hong Kong Mountain, and a ski slope was, with a rope tow, was developed there, 
This is from 1966. It didn't look, let me go back, it didn't look that big then, but a little steep. And you yanked on that rope till you held on for dear life and it yanked you up uh, the mountain. And that was a lot of fun. 1966, 67, 68, uh, about halfway up the hill. And you also could have a little toboggan in the area, a little sled area. And this is one of my favorite photos too. Look at the faces on those kids. Huh? The kid in the middle can't even look. <laughs> but, you know, that's just what it's all about right there. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And the idea became that uh, why not go for a regular ski area with a chairlift? So they started building a chairlift on the mountain. And I won't go into all the details I did last time about the politics and the problems. And the, but there were a lot of problems. It took two or three years or more to get the chairlift in operation. Uh, but eventually it did get into operation. This was the first day it opened on March 2nd, 1969. And the first people to go up the chairlift were Mr. and Mrs. Edward Gill. And Mrs. Gill is saying to Mr. Gill, how are we going to get back down? We don't have skis on. <laughs> and he's saying, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I think that's one of the Donahue kids in the front. Uh, in March 2nd, it opened. And he said, gee, that's awful late. Uh, 1969, February 69. Uh, a lot of storms, a lot of snow, I think there were three days of school. And we had a regular February school vacation, but then a series of storms. Only three days of school in February, and another big storm launched first. So they were, they said, ah, why not? It's ready, let's open it. So they had about three or four weeks of skiing uh, in March. And then they had 1970, they opened on Christmas Day. So 70, 71, and then into 71, I think 72. A lot of problems, a lot of, uh, again, some politics, some financial problems, some lack of snow, uh, you name it. But when it was operating for two or three years, two or three seasons, the Lumen Ski Area, or uh, uh, on Mount Inatu, was it, it just had one chair left, it had three or four different trails. Just a couple of trails there. And it had night skiing too, so it was kind of neat. Seven days a week, plus at night. Uh, it's hard to believe now. But, and finally, it was subject to um, a lot of vandalism that was occurring in the area too. So it was, it was difficult to keep a ski area going um, this far south. And it really closed in 72. The slope faced, uh, I would say, the northwest slope of the mountain. You can see the corner of the rehab there. This is before Country Club Heights was built, and the roadway on the left leading up to the rehab. And way up in the distance of the hill, you can see the Country Club. That's the angle that you, of the mountain that the slope was on. And there's still some reminders of it uh, today. If you walk up on, on a mountain, you'll see these concrete blocks. And this looks like an area where actually there was earth on top that you'd get off the ski lift and ski down off the, off the ski lift. And there's cement blocks up there still that held the, uh, the, the big poles that had to be put in place. And that's roughly the area today, if you look uh, from the rehab, that's what it looks like today. It's all grown in. So we're going to end with a couple of reminders of the past. I took the liberty of taking a few photos myself last week, last weekend, not this uh, not yesterday, but the Sunday before yesterday. It was a little cloudy day, but that's the remnants of Foley Beach as it looked last weekend. Uh, not much left to it now. And all the area where the parking lot is has been built up four or five feet higher than it was. And some of the stairs are still there looking out over Bill and Hazel's hot dog stand, which is still, still there. Some of the stone walls built by the WPA where the bathhouses stood, are still there. Some of the stairways, beautiful field stone walkways coming down from the street, this one opposite Buckman Street, are still there. 
This is the uh, looking from the parking lot. I climbed down to close to the water and looked back towards the beach. And on the left, you can see very faintly under the water, the top of the stone wall that was built in 1938. All the water. There's another version of the stone wall out on your left hand side. The water's over it almost year round now. And that area has all been built up. This was all beach area in the earlier photos. And you can see how the grade has changed above Lake Avenue. The field stone walls at the end of uh, opposite Hudson Street are still there. The five different levels of the walls are still there. Some of them are in better shape than others. The very bottom level on the left is you know, pretty much beaten up and underwater most of the year. Some of the stairways, this is the one leading to the very lowest level. They're, they take a lot of water over the year and they just don't uh, stand up very well. But some of the stone walls are still very beautiful today. All the work of the WPA projects in the 1930s. And you know where this is, right? Come on, let me hear you guess where this is. The reservoir. That's right. I hiked up on my mountain for you. <laughs> and I drank. Oh, no, that's okay. That's all right. I, I need it. I need it. And I dragged my son with me. He was thrilled to go. Uh, this is the reservoir. Way off in the distance in this picture, you can see the granite uh, base of the uh, gatehouse. Remember the gatehouse? Uh, right there. I think. And this is the ledge on the left. There's still a little water on the bottom. It's just rain water. That, and it's all grown up, grown up over the years, obviously, with vegetation and trees. But there's that base of the gatehouse again. And remember the water at one point when it was full would be right up to the top of that. And I walked out on the wall, and uh, my wife doesn't know that, but I walked out on the wall, balancing myself as I went, and took a view from the top of that gatehouse and look down into the reservoir. And I gotta tell you, it's still worth the climb. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous view from the top of the reservoir. If you have the ability and the energy to do it uh, any time of year, it is still a gorgeous view. And this was a very cloudy day, but it's uh, just gorgeous. The Zakem Bridge, the skyline of Boston, this is from the top. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and this uh, was a nice reunion that evening for uh, Stitchy Uthridge, who was with us this evening, uh, Ski, and uh, on the left is Jack Forbes, who again would have been here uh, except for uh, death in the family, so Jack of the, uh, those lifeguard pictures, uh, still smiling, still the hat, love that hat. Uh, it's still, Hong Kong is, you know, if you ask me what is Wuben's greatest asset, you don't have to think too long to know that it's, it's Wuben's people. But second is Hong Kong. Thank you very much for coming. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just a, two final slides. Let's talk about, let's all practice this now. It's not on on like uh, Goldie Hawn, the actress, it's not Hawn. It's not Hawn, Hawn with a D, it's Hawn, Hawn. Um, a lot of people made tonight happen. Uh, they all, and I just want to read them off quickly because they, they all helped me with this presentation. They gave me photographs, Leon Basile, postcards, the Hawn Pond Ice Company card. Kathy Conley at DPW gave me information on the reservoir. Jay Corey, the city engineer, gave me those great old reservoir pictures. Marie Cody, a uh, picture of Ed Foley. Jimmy Hagerty gave me several pictures of the beach uh, from the Times. Uh, Margaret and Ski Galan came up with some nice pictures. Jack Forbes, I mentioned Jim Glennon. I mentioned those pictures of the drought. Jerry Keogh, as always, a couple of nice photos. Judy Kelly, I think one of the airplane uh, envelopes. Kathy Lissaro, in so many ways, helped uh, Richard Mahoney, the Lewis Linskitt sketches. Mary Mack, my mother, came up with a photo of her. The group in the 30s, Phil Medeiros, took the 
picture of the Indian Bowl. Bill and Ellen Muse were a big help uh, with a lot of pictures and, and information as well. Bill Morenin, uh, newspaper articles, John O'Neill, lots of old postcard pictures and other photos. Mark Rose along with the ski. Helene uh, Sullivan Chekowitz was here to help me identify those kids in the picture. Uh, Eddie Wall had some nice pictures of the ski area, the rope toe. And last but not least, the Wooden Public Library, Glennon Archives, especially the Freno Collection, and the Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. John, thank you. A tremendous job once again, and that brought back so many memories. If you um, enjoyed tonight's program, I do hope that you'll consider becoming a member of the Historical Society. We rely completely on donations from people such as yourselves. And um, there are also some donation boxes on the outside in the lobby. And if everybody who came tonight gave just a dollar, we'd be able to cover most of the costs of um, the mailings for one of these programs. So thank you very much, and we'll see you back in September. Thank you.